So greetings. I welcome you all for the Info-B Virtual Global Summit, day one, August 12, 2022. I, let me introduce myself. My name is Dr. Ashraf Fatima, and I'm an associate professor from Lord's Engineering Institute of Technology, Telangana, Hyderabad. And for today's session, we have a workshop on uh, track one, that is humanities and social sciences, theme two, organizational change, mitigation, limitation for capacity building. And the topic for today is leading transformational change in, in, in education. The speaker today is Mr. Des Collier. He's actually a board member of InforOBE South Africa and is also the founder and coordinator and model of OBE Learning Center programs that is Delta Motor Corporation South Africa since 1998. He's a founding director of Transformational Corporate Training System since 2003. He's also a senior associate, Howard Cook Associate 2003 to 2010, leadership and performance training management and consulting. He's also an academic editor, proofreader of PhD, BBA and MBA dissertation for the business schools, South Africa, Switzerland so, and uh, SMC University business schools. And he's also a freelance writer, training facilitators, entrepreneurial author, training of Collier Corporate Communications since 2012. He's also an educator since 1979, an English specialist and a matrix examiner. So I would like Mr. Des Collier to please continue with the session of Inborby Virtual Summit, the workshop. So I hand over the mic to him so he can continue. I welcome you, sir. So please start with the session. Thank you, Dr. Fatima. Um, and thank, thank you, you and welcome to all the delegates online. The in, thank you for the introduction. And this is the session we are in. And the topic for this workshop is leading transformational change in education. Okay. With specifically the topic for the workshop, the, the title of the workshop is leading future focused change to implement authentic transformational outcomes-based education. As introduced, my name is Des, and I greet you from Cape Town in South Africa. The purpose of this workshop is to alert you, political leaders and educational authorities to recognize the main components of any existing education system that we must be willing and able to, to, to change in order to implement authentic outcomes-based education. During this workshop, I will present you with three mini case studies to consider firstly, the drivers of change the future drivers of change. Secondly, the implications for education. And the third case study will be a personal experience of attempts to transform education. If I look away from you, it's because I'm using two screens, not because I'm being rude. Um, the aim of the, of the workshop is to have a conversation. Um, the technology is brilliant that we can sit like this and talk to each other across the globe, around the world. However, communication this way is not easy. Uh, we can't see each other. Uh, my screen is full of um, slides and all kinds of buttons to press to control things. So the best way uh, to communicate with me anyway is just to unmute yourself and say, hey, Des, can I ask a question? Hey, Des, I want to make a suggestion. I do not mind being interrupted. Please do so. Just unmute yourself and shout out and say, um, I'd like to make a suggestion there or whatever. All right? Um, All right. Or alternatively, you can use the chat function. And I'm sure my moderator, Dr. Fatima, uh, will, will keep an eye out for that. If yes. from my side, there is a break in transmission, it will either be because the internet connection is down from Cape Town, or there's been a power failure, which we've been having a lot of lately. If that happens, 
don't go away. Stay with, um, stay with Dr. Fatima. Either way, I will be back in 10 minutes because I'll either start the generator if the power has gone down or I will restart my, uh, my, my router and usually it, it recovers. All right. The outcome of the workshop will be that you will know what changes are needed. You will be able to participate and contribute to transformational change in your institution. And you'll feel less overwhelmed, hopefully, and less uncertain. You'll be open to opportunities and you'll be equipped, or you'll feel equipped to manage challenges. That's what we're aiming for by the end of the workshop. On day two of this global summit, I will present a parallel session that'll be on, that'll be tomorrow. Um, that'll be, it is titled Preparing an Action Plan to Implement Authentic Transformational OBE. So in a sense, I'm setting the scene for the parallel session tomorrow, uh, where we will actually put this all down into a draft action plan that you will be able to use for your institution. Just to get our thinking together and to give you a chance to settle down and get used to my accent and so forth, I'll give you a bit of background and then we'll get into the first case study. Remember, at any time you can stop me if I go too fast or you want to ask something, just unmute yourself and say, all right? If I don't get any interruptions, I'll assume everything's fine. <laughs> All right, being genuinely future focused in education changes everything. And that's, I think, what you're gonna realize as you go through other sessions in this, in this summit. Not only are urgent changes necessary in the purpose, philosophy, and delivery of education, but also the drivers of future change are multiple and changing constantly at an accelerating pace. The paradigm changing premises of authentic outcomes-based education. These are the premises on which outcome-based education is based and they are paradigm changing. These were updated recently by Dr. Bill Spady in 2021. The premises are the following, and I'm sure you'll hear these over and over in the other workshops and, and presentations. Authentic outcomes-based education is founded on the following. Education exists to elevate humanity's development and future. Every learner has vast potential for fulfillment and success. Learners learn successfully at different rates and in different ways. In fact, you can add there, all learners can learn successfully, but not on the same day or in the same way. Learners learn successfully at different rates and in different ways. Successful learning promotes efficacy and the desire for more learning. Empowerment is consciously choosing how to experience every moment. Human potential and capacities far exceed what education now addresses. Even now, today, in, in, in a few cases, that's a generalization, but... And then finally, institutions define and can transform what success means. That's like a premise that, that, that is possible to do in an institution. That will lead to quite a lot of debate, I think. The paradigm, that the, the, the premise that I'm essentially interested in from way back, all right, when I first met Dr. Spady was this one, the essential paradigm change inducing premise to my mind, and I'm, I hope you'll agree, is that the one that says all learners learn successfully at different rates and in different ways. This was formally expressed by Dr. Spady as Aptitude is not a fixed capacity to learn, but a pace of learning. This is the premise, to my mind, that makes authentic outcome-based education the antithesis 
of the long practiced first industrial revolution test driven statistical norm curve moderated education system we've been practicing for the last two, 300 years. A system that was not intended nor designed to develop people, but to select and predetermine those who were deemed to have sufficient fixed capacity to learn from those who did not. It is this essential OBE premise that requires fundamental change of paradigm in the mindset of educators. It's a complete change in what we are trying to do in providing education to learners. Within this paradigm, based on this premise, within a transformational OBE paradigm, mindset, way of thinking, based on that premise, the following do not make any sense. Placing learners in age determined, thus constraining cohorts, otherwise known as classes, in which no, they sir, must proceed uh, through the system. Yes, Mr. Descolier, once again. Actually, yes. I've been instructed that it should be complete slideshow. So if you can press F5, because the entire screen should be covered with the slide, it seems, as per the instruction by the host, that is Vajit, sir. I must press F5. Yeah. Okay. I've got F1, 2, 3, and... Oh, there it is. If I just press the button, or must I use shift? Yeah. Is it... Shift F5 or just F5? F5, just F5. Just F5. Here we go. Yeah. How's that? No, nothing has been shown. You first uh, uh, press an escape button, sir, once. All right. Escape first and then for first F5. First escape, yeah. Yeah, okay, let's do that. Yeah. How's that? Yeah. Now you press F5, sir. Okay, again. Let's go again. Escape. How's that? No, no. Escape. Now it is okay. Just you That's have it. to. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. You have to. You have to just press F five now. Just press F five. All yes. right. Okay. Nothing has been shown. Uh, can you just do one thing, sir? Yes. Like we have upon towards your left, we have PPT, then we have file, home, insert, design, right? We have red color file towards the left top. We have file um, button, right? All right, let me try file. something. Towards the left, we have red color file. File. Um, no. Let me try something. From the beginning, if you can click, I think so we can do it. All right. Nothing. Press file. Yes. You need to click on from beginning, sir. All go right. Go for escape. Go for escape. Escape. And now below file, you have, yeah, yeah, exactly. From beginning, just click upon it. That's it. Click. Click on it. No, 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 no. Yeah, click on it. Double click, sir. Double click. Yeah. I wonder why um, you're not it's getting not a full screen. Uh, otherwise, you go for the from beginning. Yeah, yeah. Click upon that two times. Yeah, two times. Yeah. If you can yeah. click, I think we can do it. All right. Let me try something else. Um,
from beginning we should have actually oh no i've done something wrong now all right let's go back here oh wait i know actually this is live no so everything should be just perfect he's saying that that's what i'm saying if you can click on uh, if you can click on from beginning or else we'll do one thing sir you just go towards the down complete down bar the footer part yeah footer we have south africa then we have notes we have comments right if you can see the footer part yes yeah we have notes footer part uh, the footer 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 part notes comments right slide number 1 to 55 towards the red color footer complete footer down english south africa slide number 1 of 55 can you see that no 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 now we have just opened ppt right uh, i tried to Huh. Now, when we are going for PPT, uh, once again, yeah, you just click upon the PPT, sir. Otherwise, we can go like this, I guess. If you go, if you can go for the next slide, go for the next slide after in four B. Uh, click okay, upon the page uh, down tab. Page down. Down, we have four arrows, right? Yes, sir. Mr. Des. Yes, sir. Bottom right corner. Uh, here, uh, with the sign. Which... Can you hear me? No, I'm completely lost. Achha, once again, buttons. once again. Too many buttons, too many everythings. <laughs> this is why <laughs> okay, okay. technology is okay. A not a problem. Yeah, yeah, not a problem. We'll do one thing. This now the screen is visible. You can see the screen, right? Zoom. Zoom. Yeah. Screen is ready. In 4B Virtual Travel Summit, transforming education and empowering learners, right? Yes, sir. The first slide is clear. Hello? Yes. Yeah. Now, after that, hello. we this have. Is, uh, hello. Sorry to interrupt. There's no, over. there's everyone. no Zoom button here. Yeah. Sorry, to interrupt everyone. This can I take over to help this this for you? This is. Ah, that will be better. I feel. Yeah. Thank you so much. So, sir, can you click on the uh, from current slide from the uh, left top? Can you go to the PowerPoint on the left top? It says from current slide. Can you hear me? Yes, it is. I can, but none of these things you are saying are here. There's nothing here. Let me try oh. more. Um, can I can I request screen uh, request remote control if you can allow me? I can try to do that. Yes, if you can do remote control, I wouldn't know how to do it yeah. for you. Yeah, they can, did, did you get a notification that I can? Uh, yes, it says there. All right. Approve. Okay, allow me. I'll take care of it. Are we still live? Are we on recording? Yes, we are. We are recording, actually. Okay. And we apologize for this technological break. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, sir. Like it do happen because it's actually it's virtual, so obvious. Uh, I cannot control your screen. That's something that I uh, Mr. Des, I feel that if you can open your presentation oh. once more. No, he's there. I mean, he doesn't need to do anything with the. No, no, the because actually, from the beginning and current slide, we have two options, right? If we can click one upon that twice, then accordingly, the slides will come one after the other, and that will be full screen. 
Yeah, the the, so the slides mustn't. The slides mustn't. The, the slides won't play automatically. I need to click them when I'm ready. I have a full screen on on here. Yes, yes. Uh, we'll do one thing. Yes, sir, Mr. Des, we have yeah. a keyboard, right? Upon the keyboard, there are four arrows towards your right, towards your left. Yes. Right, we're back, folks. We do apologize for that uh, technical breakdown. We have a team in the back there who are um, on the ball and making sure that everything comes right. So we are yes. back. And as I was saying, when we were talking about how the workshop was going to proceed. And I said that by the end, you will know what changes are needed to make transformational, to implement transformational outcome-based education. You'll be able to participate in transformational change and contribute in your institution. And hopefully you will feel less intimidated and uncertain um, and equipped to deal with challenges as they happen. That's the next session that I'll be presenting to you tomorrow. I'm just catching up to where we were. Things are changing at an accelerating pace. Those are the premises on which education is based, on which um, outcome-based education is placed. And the premise for my purposes today is the one that says aptitude is not a fixed capacity to learn, but a pace of learning, which makes these things, if that's the premise in this new paradigm of how we deliver education, then these three things don't make sense. Placing learners in age determined, thus constraining for many uh, cohorts, otherwise known as classrooms, classes, in which they must progress through the system. That's that. That's their lot for their education time. They must move through with that group. Also, implementing lockstep teaching within tightly scheduled timeframes within a rigidly structured, confined learning area, also known as a classroom, and then expecting all learners to succeed on standardized, pre-scheduled, written, verbal tests. In other words, on the same day, they, they must succeed on the same day in the same way. That all follows from that essential paradigm changing premise. Yeah. Aspects of OBE, aspects of outcome based education manifest in Benjamin Bloom's Mastery of Learning Taxonomy, the taxonomy for mastery learning. When you go, if I go back to my previous point, when many people hear all learners can learn, many people get very concerned that, oh, but that means we're going to lower the standards. You know, we were not all as clever as each other. Some are cleverer than others. Not under this premise. It means everybody is gifted. And in the right environment with the right, right opportunities, all can succeed. The secret is we need to bring those gifts out of the pupils, of the learners, not pour stuff in. That's what this paradigm is trying to tell us. Goldman also identified multiple intelligences. Daniel Goldman, I'm sure you've heard of him. There's music intelligence. There's, there's kinesthetic intelligence. There's verbal intelligence. There's about 12 of them. In fact, I think the last, there were 25 intelligence is identified. Those are different ways of learning that people have. Um, the natural, um, learn, uh, natural intelligence are people who just know all the names of the plants and the birds. They just can tell you. They can point to that animal over there and tell you what it is. All right. Then we have in the workplace, a gentleman called Howard Gonder, who amplified this different learning styles into the workplace, that in the workplace, you're, when you train your staff, giving them one kind of standard training is going to dis, uh, disadvantage some people. So with that bit of background, and I'm going to, we're going to move quite quickly, 
to, to, to catch up some time. The first case study I've called changes required by the accelerating drivers of the future. So what will follow through here is drivers of the future. What are the changes required by the accelerating drivers of the future? As we work through this study, what I'll be doing is showing you some slides. As we go through them, note down the factors in your situation that affect your situation, your institution or your organization and put them under the following headings. As we go through, just under these following headings, note down, oh, that's a political factor. That's an economic factor that impacts us in our school or our university. So use those headings there and just jot down. You don't have to complete all of them. Just as they occur to you, put them under those headings. And then at the end of the re going through the study, we'll discuss them. Um, you know, hopefully we'll get some feedback for you from you and we will we'll get as much interaction as we possibly can. Remember the, the purpose here is to try and have a conversation. So the headings are political, economic, legal, technical, environmental, and governance or ethical. And there's one missing, you probably have, have, have missed, spotted it, is social, forgive me, I left that off the slide. So it should be P, political, economic, social, legal, technological, environmental, and then governance or ethical. So if you use those headings and just include social, what social factors are impacting on your institution as I go through these changes that are driving, the, driving change in the future? Futurists, are saying things like this, that there are periodic ways of technological, periodic waves of technological and economic change that have been occurring since they've been identified from 1845 going through to 2020. That's a, that's a small grid, that's a small chart, I know, but you get the impression of mounting waves moving towards the right, towards 2020. These ways of change have reordered the way we work, the organization of business and markets, how those are organized, markets and businesses. These ways of change have changed the role of government. This is according to the futurist uh, Robert Atkinson, and this is his diagram. Um, where in the beginning, I'll just go close and read to you. In the beginning, the things that were affecting the change were the discovery of iron the power of water, mechanization, textiles, and commerce, the whole idea of commerce, merchants, and banks. Right back then, we are now well into the sixth wave, all right? The sixth wave has sustainability, radical resource productivity, whole system design, biomimicry, green chemistry, industrial ecology, renewable energy, and green nanotechnology. The previous wave was the one that had all the digital networks, biotechnology. That's people talk about the fusion, all right? Biology and technology. Software and information technology were in the previous wave, which we called the information age. If you remember, we are now fully into the sixth wave. And that was only in 2020, we're in 2022 already. So these are ways of change that are changing the way we work, live and play and so forth. Futures, the future, according to uh, uh, Professor Sahel Iniatula, he is one of the top futurists in the world and he currently works for UNESCO, pretty relevant. And according to him, the future is an asset a resource and a narrative to be employed to change the present. The future is an asset to change the present, according to Professor Inyatula. Future studies is driven by two convictions, which explains that statement of his. The first is future studies believes there is no future. The future does not exist except in our imaginations. There is no future 
to plan for in that sense. But we can shape the future because it isn't fixed. We can shape the future in essential ways by the choices we make today. Now you could argue that we can't change our ultimate fate, right? Granted, but how we get there, we can probably influence by the choices we make today. You can make a bad decision today, spend too much money today and your future tomorrow when you must pay your, your rent, you won't have the money to pay. So you've not created a terrible day for yourself in your future by something you did today. Okay, so we're looking at the drivers of the future. And you're making notes of things that strike you as what will impact on you in your institution under those uh, headings, political, economic, social, and so forth. Future studies is recognized as a strategic planning technique that is used by future focused global organizations all over the world. They assume that there is no single future for which to plan. The futurists, the future study, the people who do the future studies, they assume there is no single future for which to plan. The futurists research several factors. They identify mega trends based on piles of data and stats and facts. And they project those. to generate several possible futures. What is possible? What is probable? What is likely with these trends that are going this way at the moment? In order to select from those probable, possible, likely futures, a preferred one. In order to agree on what to do to achieve that desired future for themselves, for individuals, for families, for organizations, and indeed for countries. For countries, they usually do scenarios for about 40 years ahead. Futurists do not make predictions. This is not fortune telling or you know, waving charms around. This is based on stats and, and so forth. They don't make predictions. In fact, they tend to answer the question, what will the future look like? with the answer, well, what do you want it to look like? Which is very empowering, actually. It means we do have some control. Drivers of the future. We now stand on the threshold of a new age, the age of revolution. This is what the futurists are saying. In our minds, we know that the new age has already arrived. In our bellies, we are not sure we like it because we know we have a sense that it is an age of upheaval, tumult, fortunes made and unmade at head snapping speed. I mean, how long has Elon Musk been on the international scene? And suddenly he's the wealthiest man in the world, just adapting the way we transport ourselves in vehicles. That was sudden. It was, it was just suddenly now. There was Elon Musk and suddenly there he is, right? Change has changed. It is no longer moves in a straight line. Change itself now is discontinuous. It is abrupt. It is seditious. In the words of Gary Hummel, you might have heard of him. He's a, he's a well-known strategist, business strategist. We are living in a post-normal times. Stephen Hawking, you remember him, all right? He said that in 2013, that's 10 years ago already, post-normal times. And you've noticed I haven't even mentioned COVID yet. He said, we are in an age of complexity. That was 10 years ago. We have moved from an age of knowing to thinking, from a knowledge era to a conceptual era, which means that creativity and imagination are essential. These are some forecasts that were made by a man called Thomas Frey. Forecasts that were made in 2015, 
looking ahead to 2030. We haven't quite got there yet, but I'm using these. These are not the latest uh, forecasts that the futurists are putting out there. All right. I'm showing you fairly old ones, actually, so that you can become aware that we are in the thick of this. And look at how many things there that were said, oh, in 2015, this and this and that. People are, oh, no. well, take a look. Okay. By 2030, says Thomas Frey, 2 billion jobs will disappear but they will return in different forms. Over 50% of them will be freelance or part-time projects. In other words, full-time uh, employment, not likely to be there in 50% of the jobs. It will all be part-time or freelance. 50%, yeah, that's quite a startling one. 50% of all colleges will collapse under the weight of their own expenses or their fees being just way beyond the, the reach of the majority of people. 50% of all colleges will collapse, paving the way for a new education industry to emerge. That's what we're in at the moment, a new emerging education industry. The world's biggest internal co in internet company, sorry, the biggest internet company will be in the education business by 2030. And it says, uh, Thomas Frey said, it will be a company we have never heard of before. You might already start thinking, no, but what about Google Scholar and, and, and MOOCs and, okay? Well, there. This was 2015, he was saying this. There will be a surge of micro colleges, on the other hand, requiring less than six months for training and apprenticeship in order to enable people to change jobs quickly because things are changing so fast or to be updated in your existing job in order to keep up. So we haven't got three years to go to university anymore. We've got six months to learn something new, master it and start implementing. Basic computer programming will be a core skill required in over 20% of all jobs by 2030. 20%, that's one, for one in five people will have to be able to program computers. And I missed one. There will be a surge of micro colleges requiring less than six months for you to learn quickly. If you look at the bottom, bottom right of that slide, what do you see? <laughs> um, that Android there the telescreen on her chest is a receptionist who is a, a robot receptionist in a ho in hospital in, in Belgium. These drivers of change mean that the workplace is being transformed. Robots are doing work routinely done by humans before. Jobs by humans now require intellectual capacity and creativity that machines cannot deliver. People are having to develop work skills through constant education. We've been talking about lifelong learning for quite some time. You don't stop learning when you leave school anymore. People must be able to learn quickly and efficiently. The best way to do that is to know what your learning style is. Hello, Howard Gardner, Daniel Goldman. Are you a verbal thinker? Are you a visual thinker? Are you a kinesthetic person? The kinesthetic learners in your class are the ones who can't sit still for more than five minutes. They've got to be doing something. Otherwise, they can't learn. All right. And they drive you up the wall, <laughs> depending on the kind of environment you've created. People must be able to adapt. Hello, to part time work, teleworking, virtual meetings. The technology keeps interfering. <laughs> Just joking. Working remotely, job sharing, and entrepreneurship at all ages. The workplace has now already arrived at two major branching points. The first is that Generation Z, that's our children, are entering the workplace and the marketplace. They will be entering the workplace and marketplace by 2030. Millennials, sorry, that's not Generation Z, it will be my grandchildren. Uh, my children were the millennials, okay? 
the millennials will be now be in their 30s and 40s, midlife. And some baby boomers, that's me, might still be around and going strong. The second branching point is that the impact of humanity on the environment has now reached global uh, uh, dimensions, global proportions. And the earth is rapidly running out of capacity to sustain human life in terms of, and you heard it all, climate change, water, food, energy. One futurist said the next wars will be fought over water, not oil. Drivers of the change we're looking at, case study. The next generation of jobs will arise from future industries that have emerged already. These were, the, they were saying this in 2015. Well, here we go, 3D printing. These are new emerging industries. Virtual currency, Bitcoin, blockchain. Online retailing, hello, one cart. Get your shopping delivered to you today. Just a phone call. Big data, augmented reality, wearable devices, health-centric digital devices, and a wristwatch that reads your pulse, your heart rate, your temperature. Industries are now moving rapidly to more automated world in which mobile robots with unprecedented cognitive abilities are making inroads into every aspect of life, whether it's home, medicine, school, and so on. That's what the new jobs, that's where the new jobs are going to be coming from. Remember the two billion that are going to be lost and then reappear in another form? This means that the demand for real time experiences, because technology makes it happen faster. So we have an, a generation who is an instant generation. They want it now. Just my cell phone, make the call, it must happen, yes? Demand for real-time experiences requires faster processing and faster response times. That puts immense, immense pressure on employees to perform instantly. People want instant gratification now. This will lead to increased demand for wellness goods because people are going to be stressed. Businesses will shift from being profit-driven to being purpose-driven. This will require less hierarchy and bureaucracy, less levels in your organization, much more collaborative working techniques, more strategies focused on women, and new concepts about career paths. If there isn't a big hierarchy, where, where are you going to climb your way through the organization over the next 40 years? which is why your millennials usually stay in a company only for about five years because there's nowhere to climb to. So they move up into another organization and the, us baby boomers say, yeah, they're job hoppers. They, you know, they can't keep a job. Well, actually, the more companies you've been through, the better experience you have, et cetera. But this, that's another discussion. Drivers of change will lead to the fact that mega cities will emerge and they are emerging already. Mega cities will emerge and will compete <clears throat> for foreign investment, tourism and trade. It won't be on a national level anymore. I'm thinking of Chicago, even I'm thinking of Cape Town. Mega cities, metros, yeah? And new economic models based on a sustainable society index will be developed and a human development index. Sustainable new economic models. I read a thesis recently about the circular economy that is becoming the rage. And these indexes, these indices, sustainable society index and human development index are becoming the measures of a successful society. The GDP is, is, is losing, is losing um, credibility. Now, Parallel to all those technological drivers of change. Note this, and as you go through the other sessions uh, talking about transformational OBE, especially what Dr. Bill Spady has to say. Parallel to this, there is 
a growing awareness of spiritual intelligence in the workplace. There is an awakening in the human spirit, almost running counter or parallel to this upsurge in technology and the rate of change, so the human spirit is awakening. The importance of, of, inter, of spiritual intelligence over the last 20 years, known as SQ, never mind IQ, all right, has grown the awareness of it, the importance of it in the workplace. There is a generation of employees now, I'm referring to the, to the millennials, but wait till you see what comes after that, who seek work that is meaningful and purposeful. Hence the shift from, yeah, money is fine, but you know, what's this for? What's the purpose, okay? They want to be heard, to make a difference, and to be part of something that is bigger. There is a growing sense that work should reflect more of who we are. I should not sell my soul to the corporate, right? <laughs> Through my work, I should be able to express who I am. These are the demands that are coming through now. Greater freedom is required in the workplace. Happiness is becoming as important as financial success. Traditional, dull, demotivating workplaces are out. Working in virtual space is in. Artificial intelligence, also called AI, will enable humans to undertake tasks of a scale and complexity never imagined before. If we use the artificial intelligence to help us, More jobs will require creative intelligence, emotional intelligence, also known as EQ. So we've got IQ, SQ, and EQ are the ones that get bandied around the most. And the ability to manipulate AI. In other words, a future career is you want to know how to manage robots, not be managed by them. <laughs> If leadership in this whole turbulent environment, if leadership, according to Odgers in 2005, if leadership in all of this is the art of enlisting people to embrace a vision or a goal as their own, and then inspiring and encouraging them to sustain their commitment so that by their own action and commitment, they can turn that vision into reality through their own actions and their own commitment because they've been, the spirit within them has been, all right, released through leadership. If that's what leadership is, if you agree with that, then the most basic role for corporate leaders or educational institution leaders being corporate, okay, has become to release the human spirit that makes initiative, creativity, and entrepreneurial and entrepreneurship possible. Instead of constraining, constraining, and pouring in and, and molding air, other way, release the gifts that in there, release the human spirit that is curious, that is entrepreneurial, that, and so on, yeah? Furthermore, in a world in which ecological resources and social equity are increasingly possible, or sorry, increasingly short supply, organizations will have to start to prove their value over again if they are to have permission to operate. Strong statement from Gary Hummel. Listen to it again. In a world where ecological resources and social equity, fair access to, all right? are increasingly short supply, organizations will have to start. Organizations who use those resources and damage environment, et cetera, et cetera, are going to have to prove their worth if social, social and civil society are going to allow them to continue to operate. I mentioned 50% of colleges will collapse, according to Thomas Frey. Um, one, just quickly, one of the main things that people were prepared to pay for an education, I learned recently, is the network that you get from being in that college or whatever. And if people are finding now that that network is either not available or is not worth it, 
they won't pay those prime amounts for that education. So education corporates are also being challenged to, to, uh, to, to prove their worth to allow it to, be, to continue to operate. That's us, that's you and me, guys. That's us as educators are being challenged. Prove that your education is worth what you're asking us to pay for it. Otherwise, we don't want it. Wow, this is hectic stuff, yeah? I'm watching the time. Um, with the break, we lost a lot of time. All right. If you would like, I can only make it about a two minute breather. We can do that and I'll give you a chance to think of or to just reflect on any notes that you've made for yourself under the PESTA leg. PESTA leg stands for political, economic, social, technological, etc. It is a very well-known environmental scanning technique, and you might well know it. I, I'm certainly even a leadership position and you're strategic, you will know of that. All right. Very quickly, would anybody like to shout some things out that they noted down? For example, say under political, I noted this. Or under technological, this is really affecting me in my institution. Governance and ethicals is a new one recently. It was introduced to that acronym. Um, good governance, increasingly. Um, I, I co-authored a book on emotional intelligence and the opening statement there, that was in 20, 2018. The opening statement there was the, the world is experiencing a global crisis in leadership. And that was in the emotional intelligence book. Huh? So good governance. Emotional intelligence, leadership crisis. Technology, in a sense, goes without saying. Environment, yes, has become very big. There are quite a few environment. You, if you can't prove your worth to operate, people are not going to allow you to just keep taking those resources. <laughs> okay, folks, I'm going to keep going into the, into the second case study unless you stop me, all right? Um, and I, I, I do apologize for rushing it a bit, but I, I would like to get to the end and, and close on time. Let me wrap that part up then by saying that the purpose of that brief scan of the future, that's a very brief scan that I gave you. It really was just scratching the surface of things that are happening out there and the things that are driving future and putting us in the position now where we're having to look at what are we gonna do with education, okay? Looking at the future forecasts and their implications for the workplace, first of all, okay? What's happening out there? Where are we going to make a living? Where are the youngsters that you are educating and how are they going to make a living? I, I, I feel for young people. They look at these trends and they look at what's happening in the world and. Many of them are just in despair. They look at us, what? <laughs> you know? um, but the point of that whole scan and the implications for the workplace was to make, to awaken your awareness, to make us aware of the radical changes happening right now. The things they said would happen in 2015, we are now in the thick of it. And as I said, I haven't even mentioned COVID yet. <laughs> It will open your thinking, hopefully, to a broader, different possibilities. It'll open your thinking to the broader possibilities now with, with, the, thing, with the, the technology we've got and what we will be capable of if we master AI and not, are not controlled by it, right? So it'll awaken you to the awareness of the rapid changes happening around you, that you're not locked in your... Um, academic classroom and, th and that's only it, that you are aware, that you are thinking 
of the broader possibilities, that you will know that it is possible to shape the future right? by what you decide to do today. And that you will then, we can rethink our attitude towards work, jobs, and careers. So the point of that first case study was to, 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 to bring about that kind of awareness and thinking and to start rethinking our attitudes towards work. What's it there for? To what, what are jobs? What kind of jobs? Nature of the jobs. Um, and then careers. What makes a career now? Okay, folks. Let's see. I'll, I'll see if we can catch up some time and spend hopefully more time if you want to give feedback. Case study number two. I've called this the most, the most future focused sector in the socioeconomic mix. Case study number two, what we're gonna look at here is the most future focused sector in the socioeconomic mix. This might surprise you. Again, as we go through this, as we work through the study, oh, spelling mistake there, sorry. Reflect on and note the current performance of your institution. Again, using the following headings. All right. As we go through these, as I start giving you the, 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 the study, the, the thing to look at, the situation, which is about the most future focused sector in the, in, in, in the whole mix. All right. Make notes of your performance, your institution. How does your institution perform at the moment in relation to being future focused in the socioeconomic mix with the things that are happening and going around us now? What does this all mean for us, okay, as educational institutions? And then note your, put your notes under what are the strengths of your institution in terms of its performance in all of this craziness? What are its weaknesses? Be honest. Then what are the opportunities? As I say, every challenge brings an opportunity if you can identify it. But then what are the threats? What are the current threats to the existence of your institution as you are currently operating? And I include myself in this, all right? And when I say you, I mean we. All right, let's go. Second case study. And what we'll carry through here is the words towards a desired future, right? So we've, if you like, you've looked at all those drivers. You've said, okay, if we look at this now and project and say, what will happen if we stay as we are? Where are we going to end up? All right, where would we rather end up? That would be, that'd be the best scenario. Okay, what must we do to get from here to the preferred future. If those are the possibilities, and we think that's, that's gonna be the best one for humanity and us and the learners and our children. How do we get from here to there? What choices, decisions must we make now? Or what could be the worst thing that could happen? Those are usually the formats of scenarios. Business as usual, best case scenario, worst case scenario, all right? If certain decisions go this way, we're going, to do, we're going to go down that bad route, all right? <clears throat> so, towards a desired future. Google currently is worth over 30, $370 billion currently, but it only employs 55,000 workers. 50 years ago, AT&T was worth less than those billions in today's money, but it employed 750,000 workers. 25 years ago, GM, Ford, and Chrysler generated a combined 36 billion American dollars while employing over 1 million workers. That was 25 years ago. They employed a million workers. Today, Apple, Facebook, and Google generate over a trillion dollars and employ only 137,000 workers. There's a picture for you. 
In the next 10 years, 44% of jobs will be automated. Jobs that are disappearing, right? 44% of them will be automated, like that receptionist at the hospital. 50% of them will be automated by 2035. In other words, 60% at the time I got these stats, 60% of students currently are chasing careers that will not exist when they graduate. Here's a comparison between the work skills that were needed in 2015 with those that are needed, were needed in 2020. We're, still, we're in 2022 now, all right? So I, I got these from, it was, it was done in 2015 and comparing with 2020. So it is 2020, looking back at how, what, is it, what was it like in 2015. And there are the top 10 uh, critical skills, if you like. All right. In 2015, those are the top 10. I'll leave you to read on the screen what they are. On the left-hand side, with the, what moved around. Some moved up, some moved down. Okay. On the left is what was required in 2020. That's two years ago, two and a half years ago now. <clears throat> You'll see that complex problem solving is still at the top. That's the most critical skill in this century, 21st century. You will see that creativity was number 10 and jumped to number three in 2020. Service orientation. has stayed, has dropped one, interestingly. Critical thinking has moved up to number two. And between 2015 and 2020, emotional intelligence entered the top 10 as a critical skill. It's at six in 2020. From the expert I worked with, it is now at number five as a critical skill, a critical executive skill. All right. The point is, if things continue in education as they are, in other words, what's business as usual? <laughs> All right. If, in terms of going towards a desired future, well, what if we stay as we are? If things carry on as we are, Generation Z will get the same education that we all experienced, the baby boomers. And in fact, you'll see that this is also a bit old because Generation Z, those characters in that photograph there are all entering the workplace now. It'll be Generation Alpha, I think they're calling it, who are at school at the moment. <clears throat> Heading towards a desired future. It's not surprising then with this facing us, that every country in the world, according to Sir Ken Robinson, who is the, if you like, OBE champion in the UK, every country in the world is currently transforming its education system. That was in 2016, and you can look up TED Talks on YouTube. I don't know if it will still be there after all these years, all right? Finland, in 2017, it was in the headlines. Scandinavian countries. Finland was the first country to introduce a curriculum without discrete subject categories. That was in 2017. Five years ago, they did away with English, geography, history, math, science as discrete subjects. <clears throat> because the point is, children entering school now will only matriculate in 12 to 15 years' time. So your newest cohort of intake, they will only get out of the education system in 15 years time. That will be in 20, 2040. And we're looking at what happened since 2015 to 2030. By 2045, okay, the world of work will be very different from what it is now. If we think it's crazy and hectic now, wait until you see 2045. No? When these children, when these youngsters enter the workplace, will try to make a living out there. Inevitably, 
This leads to the question of who determines the aims, purposes, and objectives of education. Who determines that? Who's in control of that? And this will come through very strongly on day three of the summit. Don't miss it. The general exchange of the future of education. All right. This is one of the big questions that comes out there. Who controls it and with what agendas? I won't say any more because that's a big topic coming out later. <clears throat> then, folks, COVID-19. The COVID-19 pandemic broke out in 2019. It accelerated the need to work remotely, to adopt various types of technology, the use of the internet, to communicate, and to manage daily business matters. I do not describe or belittle the tragedy of COVID-19 and the bereavements and the suffering in one bit. Um, it, it is tragic what it has happened. However, <laughs> I'm going to be controversial. An awful lot of power is being attributed to that itty bitty flu virus. <laughs> okay. It did accelerate uh, things. We had to go into isolation. We had to work from home. We had to use technology and we had to see what technology is available that will help us to overcome this crisis. Many people associate the new normal with the COVID pandemic. But from what we've looked at now in the previous case study, the new normal has been emerging for some time, at least the last 10 years, driven by the fourth industrial revolution, also 4IR or industry 4.0, and the rapidly evolving smart technology. Those are the things that are driving the change. Drivers of the 4IR, and people are now talking about the 5IR already, next wave, the drivers of the 4IR continue to have a profound effect on the way humans live and work, perceive their own identity, and their purpose for existence on planet. We are in what we call, they call an existential crisis. Humanity is in an existential crisis. The tragedy of COVID was the, number, was the spike in suicides. The number of people no longer seeing, whoa, what am I here for? What's the point in all this? Plus, if the robots are going to get all the jobs, okay, it's, that's the downside, the depressing side, and people can be in such despair, all right? Specifically, towards a preferred future. During the pandemic, educational institutions had to adapt and continue to provide lessons online. Even so, and almost an entire academic year, certainly in South Africa, was lost with all the restrictions on movement and cl closure of schools, the lockdown, all right? Um, so then people started getting innovative. <laughs> Teachers started preparing lessons online and putting it onto Google Scholar and the other Google platforms, yeah. And the amazing thing of it is that that crisis, the way we overcame the crisis, has shown us that learning does not necessarily have to take place <laughs> in a classroom at a scheduled time, yeah. The premise. There's the premise coming. There, there it is. Yeah? Learners do not have to learn on the same day, in the same way, in the same place. Yeah. There it is. That's what COVID revealed. You can, you can prepare lessons, put a course together, and put it online for your class. And they can do it at their own time. All right. Obviously, there'll be deadlines and, 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 and targets to meet and so forth but they can do it in their own time and they can sit in front of their computer, yes, and, but they can go for a walk or they can go and try something or you know, make a model or something like that. Of course, the fear is that paper pencil tests will simply be replaced by laptops and we'll just carry on doing the same thing and the learners will become very good at working computers. 
because that's what we assess in the end. All right, come here, you'll, you'll hear a lot of talking about assessment. Does the assessment assess what it's intended to assess? If I want to be a carpenter and make furniture, sitting in an examination hall, writing an essay about how to make a table, doesn't do it, yeah? That's not valid assessment of my ability to make a table. So the fear in my mind is that the paper pencils are gonna be just be replaced by tests on computers. Yeah? Is that the desired future? Many have argued, or many still argue, that face-to-face -face interaction will never be replaced entirely. During the pandemic, it was necessary and we did it and we saw we could do it and that we can continue with it in those particular aspects, as it were. But face-to-face -face education, and I'm inclined to agree with this, is that is essential for effective communication. As I said, we can't see each other here. I can't read you. I don't even know if anybody's listening. Yeah? I can't see your faces. I can't think, oh, they're boring them. I better just move the slide quickly or something, all right? So communicate, it's essential for communication and hence learning. How do you transfer knowledge without communicating? It is essential for developing interpersonal relations re relating to other people um, and developing social skills. How often don't we as grandparents or parents bemoan how the young people sit next to each other on a, on, on a couch with their cell phones and communicate with each other over the phone. <laughs> um, we've now realized, however, the pandemic showed that the technology is available to enable individualized learning. It was not possible before, all right? Individualized learning has always been around. There's plenty of books in the library about it, but it never actually took off because it wasn't practical for me as an English teacher, for example, to prepare 200 lessons every day different for every every learner so we use the industrial model of mass production with the technology now we can do individualized let learners do their work at their own pace in their own way in their own environment you can prepare courses learning plans and activities and make them accessible online for the learners to access at their own time, complete them at their own pace within limits, obviously, with the guidance and facilitator, facilitation of a tutor or educator. With the guidance, who do they go to and ask? Like I had to do now, you know, which button must I press to do, <laughs> to do that and that? Okay. <laughs> Who's the tutor? Who's the facilitator that they can go to? We're making fairly good time. We're nearly at the end of case study two. Here's the positive side. Uh, it sounds like an awful lot of bad news, okay? But we're looking at the most future focused sector in the socioeconomic mix. Have you worked it out what it is? In going towards a desired future, it has long been said that crisis brings opportunity, which why in the, in, I'm saying we're using a, what, we, what you will recognize as a SWOT analysis, all right? To identify threats and opportunities. If there's a challenge and a problem, there's an opportunity there to solve it in an innovative way. So there we go. Um, so opportunity. With the future we are facing, there will be a need for new sources of energy to be invented. New ways of travel to perfect, hello, Elon Musk. New medicines to discover. New types of food to develop. New kinds of infrastructure to construct, including buildings to learn in. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a minute. If you look on the right-hand side there, um, uh, it's a bit sort of uh, bright and well, rather light, but at the top is a, is a dental brace all right, you see that set of teeth there? And on the right-hand side, the bottom right is, is a prosthetic hand. Both of those were made by teenagers at school. Uh, and their price is 25 American dollars, plus a bit of labor if you want the hand. Um, yeah, your learners in your classroom 
you'll be amazed at what they are capable of. Educators who carry out the necessary changes to implement authentic OBE will transform education from being education equals knowledge transfer and assessment of knowledge retain retention. We pour the knowledge in and then you give it back to us in an essay, in an example, yeah? as depicted on the, in the picture on the left. They are all the computers, very modern, et cetera, et cetera, but look at the layout. <laughs> That's all about pupils in columns and rows for control. Yes? Look at the right-hand side. It will be transformed to future-focused, holistic, individual preparation for a preferred future. The classroom on the right, that picture was given to me by Professor Inya Tula, who I, who I mentioned earlier. When he was in Taiwan, he's from, he's from Taiwan. A headmaster phoned Professor Inya Tula and said, you know, I've got all these computers. We bought the computers for the school to move into the future, but they're all sitting in the storeroom because we don't know what to do with them. <laughs> and Professor Inya Tula went into the classrooms and he designed the classroom that you see on the right-hand side. Guess what, the, guess what the reaction from the principal was? He walked into the classroom and he said, no man, no man, how am I supposed to keep discipline in this sort of a classroom? <laughs> okay, so the discussion for case study two. If you wanna shout out, now's the time. What is, what is, your, what is strong about your institution? Is your before, what, what, what is strong about the performance of where you are educating at the moment? Based on going towards a preferred future and the things we've been looking at. What are the weaknesses? Do you have the pupils all lined up in rows and columns like that? All working on the same item on the computer all at the same time so they can write the test tomorrow with an essay? <laughs> yeah. Opportunities and th threats. Yeah, there's plenty of those. But that also, then, as I indicated, opportunities that we need to be looking at at this stage now for survival of humanity on the planet. Any shouts? Okay. Then I'll close that case study. Because the purpose of that brief scan of future forecasts and their implications for education was to reconsider what the present education system is offering our youth and what they will need to succeed in their preferred future. In their preferred future, what do they need to succeed in contrast to what the current system is actually offering them? For us to know how to use time in education, both as being an educator and as a learner, to use your time, the present, in order to bring about a preferred future. That's the basis of futurism. We can shape the future by basing it on what the choices and decisions we make now. And that is what transformational OBE is challenging us to do. Make some, some radical decisions. Okay, folks, no shouts. Case study number three. Oh, by the way, it is inevitable, if you haven't gathered already, it is inevitable. But education has to be the most future-focused industry in the economic mix. Not the automobile industry, not NASA. Education has to be the most future focused because your learners who are in your classroom today will only be leaving the system, they'll only be going away from you and graduating in 15 years time. What are they going into in 15 years time? It makes sense therefore, that educational institutions should be linked to or have a faculty that is futurist, who do the scanning and keep feeding updates into the system. Just a challenge that I put out there. 
This one I've called a story of failed, OBE in inverted marks, in, in quotation marks. So now I'm just gonna tell you a story to end off here. As you work through this study, and maybe they will make the slides available. And if you were in another, <laughs> if you were in another session and you want and you heard about this one and you want to take a look, you probably ought to get the slides and read the stuff and then reflect in the in the discussion sections. Take them back to your institution and use them to start debates and discussions and conversations. As we work through this, what lessons can be learned? From the following, as you, as I read, as I tell you this story, I'm going to tell you a story, all right? As I tell you the story, what can we learn from who drives the reform of education in this case study? In this case study, who was driving the reform? What is the nature of the agenda behind the reform process in the story? What is the immediately evident weakness in the version of OBE in this story? What is the fundamental misconception? Try and pick it up. With what aspects of the educator in this story do you identify with? What comparable experiences have you had? So this is obviously going to be the story of an educator. And do you identify? Can you notice? Oh, uh, yeah, been there, done that, all that stuff. Okay. Right. Mr. Ed, lessons learned. Mr. Ed had no idea of who he was or what purpose in life he was to pursue after 18 years of education. Hands up. Come on, own up. <laughs> Mr. Ed was trained as a secondary school teacher of English and began his career at an all boys state school in Cape Town, South Africa. He left education and spent 10 years doing various jobs in various industries. In 1991, Mr. Ed returned to education to teach English at a co-educational state secondary school in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. And it was at the time of the change in national government of South Africa. The new Mandela government embarked on a path to redress the country's past and work towards a vision for a new South Africa. You may have heard that term 30 years ago, the new South Africa. Transforming national education was one of the areas on which the government focused. Representatives of the National Department of Education researched outcomes-based education as a potentially attractive system by which to reform education in the country. In 1996, the department embarked on a process to implement its version of this system under the name of Curriculum 2005. As part of the national implementation process, together with other educators, Mr. Is, Mr. Ed was sent on a professional growth seminar to learn about Curriculum 2005. Included in the preparatory reading for the seminar was a paper by Dr. Spady, in which he explained the differences between traditional, transitional, and transformational OBE. At the time, the defining characteristic of transformational OBE was that it is future focused. That is what it is meant by transformational. It is future focused and therefore all learning should be designed down or designed back from future oriented outcomes. While reading Spady's paper, it also struck Mr. Ed that he was not the teacher of a subject, but an educator of whole human beings. Based on his prior knowledge of other systems, Mr. Ed was able to grasp immediately how this OBE system could work, transformational OBE. 
he realized immediately that transformational OBE is an entire integrated education system, not a curriculum. While the national department, which is what the national department failed to comprehend or embrace. They did, however, embrace the word transformational, which in the circumstances, most South Africans understood to mean remove the previous governing regime, all right? That's what was meant by transformational. And they got excited when they saw an education system that could transform <laughs> or be transformational in that sense. Whereas actually what it meant was future focused life performance learning. They did, however, embrace the word transformational as explained. The content of the seminar that Mr. Ed was attending to be trained was focused entirely on curriculum design, the formulation of new content subjects and group work as the new mode of delivery. Mr. Ed raised a number of issues based on what was in Dr. Spady's paper. He said that if the National Department intended to implement transformational OBE, they could throw away traditional school timetables. They might have to break down some walls and refurbish the existing classrooms and throw out the curriculum based on discrete subjects. That was back in the 1990s. Mr. Ed was politely requested to put aside Dr. Spady's paper and please to pay attention to the content of the seminar. Since the new South African government intended to implement its version of transformational OBE, a team of education specialists was sent to the United States in the summer of 1997. They met with Dr. Spady. They heard what OBE really is and immediately agreed that he should be invited to South Africa to share his expertise nationally. During his tour, and those who met up with him and worked with him realized that the new national government had set its mind on implementing transformational OBE, both for all the right reasons and for all the wrong reasons. The right reasons were the education system in South Africa at the time urgently required radical transformation from what it had been under the previous regime, where the majority of learners were disadvantaged by the education they received based on race. The wrong reasons, those were the right reasons for this reform. The wrong reasons we realized were politically driven and intended to take advantage of certain aspects, certain aspects of OBE to advance previously disadvantaged learners, such as expanded opportunity. You'll hear a lot about that. That was interpreted to mean open-ended opportunities to meet the requirements of a grade or standard. And you could end up being 23 year old in, a, in, in grade four. High level outcomes interpreted to mean reduced importance of mastery, of mastering rudimentary developmental basics. That is why I referred to Bloom's taxonomy right at the beginning, which is what OBE is partly based on. Mastery, what we're looking for, not a 40% pass, we want mastery, <laughs> okay? We want opportunities to keep doing it until it's mastered, not dropping standards. Methods of assessment, all right? This aspect, the methods of assessment were re remained focused on paper pencil tests under this OBE version, right? There were various kinds of them, but it's all it's the same old paper pencil tests. And apparently it did not require any actuality, actually passing them. And they were going to capitalize on the advantages for some learners of group or collective learning. Also, there was the opportunity to reformulate subjects to be politically correct in the new dispensation and to allow for political indoctrination in schools. 
Subsequently, a, a debate arose, another spelling error, sorry. Subsequently, a debate arose while all this going backwards and forwards and debating and co uh, courses and training. Among some South African academics and educators, a debate arose that OBE was designed only for very well-resourced schools. Regardless, actually, that the principles of OBE can be applied just as easily in a rural school beneath a big tree, if necessary. Ultimately, by 2001, Curriculum 2005 was abandoned, succumbed to this debate that it was, being, it was prejudiced, it was uh, discriminating, it was disadvantaging people again, et cetera, et cetera. So curriculum, 2000, curriculum 2005 was abandoned in 2005 in favor of a content-based traditional national curriculum statement. And that was my story. Any shouts? There are the questions. Reflect on the story. Who drove that reform? What is the agenda? I'll, I'll, I'll say it, the weakness straight away. A system and they call it curriculum. The, 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 the reform program was called Curriculum 2005. It's a system. It's a system. And you cannot implement a system, a new system in existing structures, mental, physical, or otherwise. Curriculum 2005, that's where the whole thing started going wrong, right there. All right, summing this up, and then I'll sub, sum up the, the, the session, and I think we can actually finish on time. I'll go slowly now, a little bit slower, because I'm just going to conclude, because my final emphasized point there for discussion would be to say to you, based on the case studies, the three that we've looked at, can you conclude what needs to change in the delivery of education to implement authentic transformational outcome-based education? Any comments, any, is it falling together? Is there a picture emerging? Are you seeing what the challenge is? And I hope in the rest of the summit, you will find answers to those challenges because it is, we are at a tipping point. Education is at its tipping point. <laughs> yeah, I'm using futurist terms now or branching point if you like. And there are various scenarios. Um, and yes, best case, business as usual, worst case. Um, and we need to choose the best case and decide what do we need to do now? All right. Here is a summary. If we'd had a discussion there, all right. Here's a summary of the changes that are required to implement authentic outcomes-based education. And in the next session that I do, I will open with this and we will go through steps based on these to draw up an action plan that you can draft and take back to your institution if you decide to implement authentic outcome-based education. The changes are required in every component of the, of the existing education system in the following areas. Every component in the ex existing system. In other words, the old system is out, the new system is in. Not a, oh, let's put some outcomes in this lesson. Oh yes, I do outcome-based education. My children are all working in groups. <laughs> Old system out, in system, new system, in. That's the choice here, all right? Otherwise, it won't work. You will have a story like Mr. Ed, all right? 
That's why I told you that story. Right. What needs to be changing? The paradigm. That's why I started the whole presentation with paradigm. Educators at all levels must adopt a new authentic OBE mindset. Leadership, changes under leadership. We will need to lead and manage operations of OBE centers, centers of learning, right? In other words, schools, old schools. The lead, we have to lead and manage the operations of OBE centers of learning differently. It will require re relevant training and the development of school managers and educators at all levels. And I emphasize the managers there as well. Changes in the area of outcomes. We will need to use the principles of authentic OBE creatively and skillfully to formulate future focused life role performance outcomes of significance. Answering the question, what do our graduates need to know, be able to do, and be like when they leave to pursue their preferred futures? Changes under the learning opportunities provided. We will need to develop new, integrated, relevant, and meaningful learning activities by designing down from those future, arts, future focused outcomes in the previous area of change. Learning styles, all right? Expanded opportunity will come from this mostly. We will need to incorporate and accommodate multiple intelligences and different learning styles to enable all OBE learners to succeed because the premise says they can. What opportunity are we going to give them? What kind of activities? Well, and, and incorporating the learning styles. The delivery aspect, and this includes the physical environment, the, 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 the equipment, the spaces, will need to be different. We'll need different operating models to deliver authentic OBE in the following. Modify and use the available space in the existing institutions differently. Design and construct new centers of learning differently. So if you're not going to knock your building down, like Mr. Ed suggested, find ways of using the space more effectively or build a new center that is designed for that purpose. There is a college in Grahamstown in South Africa called St. Andrews. It has, a, it has a Scottish ancestry. So they have a, an outcome-based background because um, the Scottish hires, which is one of the top university entrance uh, 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 curriculums, if you like, uh, is a, an outcome-based system. They built, when they introduced technology, into the school. It's a very traditional school, very old, et cetera, et cetera. It was founded by the 1820 settlers. They built a technology center, three floors. On the ground floor was everything you needed to do research, internet, computers, whatever. Second floor, everything you needed to do to design something and manufacture it, design it and manufacture it. Third floor was where you could demonstrate, present what you had um, created, developed, all right, the artifact, whatever it was. So the people moved through the building, okay, that, if you like, was designed for their learning process. Moving through, I've um, got about six, five, five or six minutes to go. Assessment. Changes will be needed in assessment to move towards a desired future. Lessons learned here. Authentic OBE requires appropriate methods of assessing performance. This can include self or peer and expert appraisal. If you have parents who are experts in weather forecasting and you need to have 
some geographical projects assessed, call in the parent. They'll do it willingly, I'm sure, okay? And they, they will come and look at the geography of what has been designed and the weather and all the things that the learner has put together. You'll have a professional look at it. Plus you can have peer reviews. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the world of academics, isn't it? You publish an article for an academic journal, it just gets peer reviewed by at least three or three or five um, reviewers. So that's the assessing there. Um, we need assessments that are valid and actually measure what they're intended to measure. I think I've, I've, I've hit on that a lot and you're gonna hear more of that. Your assessments should involve formative assessments. In other words, expanded opportunity again. Do it at this level first, review it, try it again, all right? Do it again, another formative assessment. So your formative assessments should be building your learners towards what eventually is a summative assessment. That there is actually a final, you know, you've designed it, it either works or it doesn't, yeah? We will talk more about that too. That's not new. That's how the workplace operates actually. Oh, there we see, I've said it. That's not entirely new, all right? because commercial organizations that conduct performance reviews and appraisals are very familiar with defined outcomes for the job, key performance indicators or standards against which that job must be satisfactory or excel, reviewing of, demonst of demonstrated competence, in other words, observation on the job or products and services supplied and quality tested, Review of demonstrated competence is the review part. And then the appraisal part leads to ongoing learning, development, and continuous improvement. In other words, lifelong learning. So it's in our blood already. <laughs> in the role of the learner, there may well need to be changes there. Well, there will need to be changes there because the learners will be expected to be active, accountable, participants in their own education and development towards their desired future. Not sitting there passively listening to the teacher all the time, all right? The role of the educator then, I think you gather, will change therefore. Educators, and I think they've realized now because the children can do it online, but they need guidance, they need help. Your role is to help out where they ask and how, and guide tutor, right? So educators to play a different role as facilitators and tutors who have been assured that beyond reasonable measures to ensure the well-being, health and safety of everyone in a center of learning, education is not about control. And I'm wrapping up. It even therefore, as I mentioned earlier, makes sense that educational institutions either should include a futures faculty, if you're a university, uh, Nelson Mandela University and Stellenbosch University in South Africa have got futures institutes and they have directors of futures and the, and the directors are futurists who do all the, the scenario planning and scanning and so forth feeding into the university, all right? They should have either that faculty there, all right, or be linked to a reputable futures institute. There are many of them around the world now to provide essential information about the future. New group of intake, 15 years time. We need to know where we're we going so we can design a curriculum for them, yeah? or to update periodically the education <clears throat> that is being offered for the whole institution to say, if that's what 15 years ahead is going to look like, then we need to start making changes in the way we're delivering. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. colleagues, that's the end of the presentation for today. I hope you found it interesting and helpful. And uh, I'll give it back to um, 
I'll give back to Dr. Fatima to close off. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. That's what a very wonderful session. The, especially the points which you have discussed, the case studies and even the conclusion was just awesome and very valuable information you have shared. I think all our attendees who are the participants and everyone must have been, uh, uh, got a good knowledge upon it. Thank you so much. And uh, finally, are there any questions? Okay, there are no questions. So I really thank uh, Mr. Descolier and even Mr. Khalid for uh, like uh, for this workshop to be successful and also especially wonderful session. Thank you so much, sir. You're welcome. Okay. Go well. Okay, thank you so much, sir.